as of last year, I believe we've managed to automate about, I don't know, a thousand different processes and we saved ten, tens of thousands of hours into administrative tasks. And those people are now free to do more value add work, which is uh, the aim of what we do. So the essence of it is transparency. We really strive to have a very transparent two-way dialogue with our people. It's a paradox here. So we free up time mm -hmm. from administrative work so that we actually get into more whiteboarding activities, you know, different ways of adding value to different processes. I, I believe that 10 years from now, we will have very few people who will only have one job. Things we are challenging the status quo, we are challenging what got us here and how can we get better. And it's fun. It's, there is no one day that looks the same. You have to have the behaviors and the values right from the get-go. Because having those and knowing what you want to nurture it will act as a compass when you make decisions. If you know from the get-go what you go after, what you are not willing to tolerate, then that particular guidance will actually help you make the right decisions, right strategic decisions. Hello the Recursive community, my name is Elena and I am an innovation reporter. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Andrea Baciu, Chief Culture Officer at UiPath, the global RPA company offering digitalization and work reform. Andrea has a background in psychology and human resources. In this video we get to discover more about her performance management plan. She aims to translate organizational and individual needs into rapid action plans to drive high performance. Hello Andrea, thank you for joining me for this interview today. Thank you Elena, I'm honored and humbled to be with you today. Let's start with the first question. What culture benchmarks do you aim to bring to the first UiPath CCO chair? Well, we have um, a culture of becoming a better version of ourselves with every project that we bring on the table, with every customer we go after, with every milestone we really aim ourselves to achieve. Culture was, is, and will always be part of how UiPath is delivering uh, results out there for the world. So the benchmark is really building on what we had, adding to what we need, and striving to get where we need to be to accelerate human achievement. How do you build an ecosystem to have a flow of communication in a multi-generational remote international team? The international team is indeed the core essence of our global workforce. So imagine we have about 3,000 people worldwide. One fourth of them are in Romania, the country where the company was born. One fourth in US, another fourth equally split between India and Japan. And another fourth of our people are living in 40 different countries around the world. So the ecosystem has to include cultural differences, time zone differences, a diverse set of tools and resources to which people from different countries would actually be able to connect with. So the essence of it is transparency. We really strive to have a very transparent two-way dialogue with our people. And we do that through the cadence of monthly all hands. Every single month we get together and we share with them the objectives we go after, what we've done last month, what we go after in the next month. That's one. Second of all, we have cultural forums in which we bring people from different parts of the world to talk about the do's and don'ts of their, of their uh, cultural diversity so that we know better how to interact with them. Uh, we have Slack, which is like the communication uh, tool out there. Um, it's less about email, it's more about instant uh, mm -hmm. communication. And this comes with the good things of being there into the dialogue when you need it the most. But also it's a little bit of a challenge because mm -hmm. there's an expectation out there to actually answer on a message on Slack versus email. But it's part of the beauty of being really, really diverse in how we operate and how we work and how we get things done. Mm -hmm. What automation do you have in place? What can you tell me about the HR robots and their advantages? 
We've started this uh, digitalization a while back. And um, if you think about the overall life cycle of a person in a company, you start from awareness to somebody that is not part of our company, and then you go all, all the way to alumni, people that are leaving us for different reasons, and they are out there hoping that they will you know, speak with heartfelt recognition for the experience they had in here. So from awareness to alumni, there are different automations that we build in the system. Just to give an example, we have a bot that is actually screening the CVs and evaluating the data in there so that it gives to the hiring manager and the recruiter a pipeline of CVs that would match better to the candidate we look after. And then imagine somebody is getting on board with us. There is the Rocketeer, which is a bot that is um, making the people manager aware of different milestones of the new hire into the process. It tells when is their first week, mm -hmm. their first month, their first three months, and that it inspires the people manager to actually have a discussion with that new person, mm -hmm. getting them immersed into the way we work. And then more into the life cycle of a person, think about Athena, who is our trusted guide and advisor of mentoring and mentorship. So what Athena does is matching the two of us. If I am a mentee and I'm mm -hmm. in need for public speaking, for example, mm -hmm. and you hold yourself as, as an expert on public speaking, Athena knows what our strengths and areas of development and can match the two of us so that we get to learn from, from one another. And then as you go through the life cycle, there are different automation that we build either for the people manager or the actual person for, for their experience to be more meaningful, more focused on the dialogue and less on the administrative tasks. And we haven't done that by ourselves. Like in our company, we have the COE, the Central of Excellence, which is exactly that team that puts it all together in terms of the business need being that in HR or in finance or in whatever team that we have, and the actual value add that that particular person should focus on. So strongly recommend any company out there to actually think through strategically how they want to bring automation uh, into their company. And the, the value of a COE is really, really instrumental. As of last year, I believe we've managed to automate about, I don't know, a thousand different processes and we saved 10, tens of thousands of hours into administrative tasks. And those people are now free to do more value at work, which is uh, the aim of what we do. Automation has the ability to save humans time. What does the UiPath team do with the extra time? Any fun initiatives in the company? We do more work with the extra <laughs> time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a paradox here. So we free up time mm -hmm. from administrative work so that we actually get into more whiteboarding activities, you know, different ways of adding value to different processes. It's really specific. It's not a one size fits all. So when we get into automating the work for ourselves, we start from the need of saving time for our people. And actually it's a self-driven process. You know, you end up sitting on a um, chair in front of a computer for many numbers of days or weeks and then you come to realization that you have this little task here that you do it every day and then there is when we start the design thinking process on how to take that work automate it so that we save number of minutes or number of hours in, in a week so there is there is a lot of thought that we put into designing the workflows and the processes so that we identify those that are repeatable and those that could actually elevate our team members to do more value add. That's the core of the automation process itself. The process has to be repeatable. And if it is repeatable, that means that you save that number of minutes or hours per day um, and you can focus in different areas. Where we focus? Well, when I share with you the different bots that we build into the life cycle of a person, we take that number of minutes, hours a day, and we focus that effort into designing an experience which brings meaning to their work. Like we spend a lot of time in understanding learning needs. 
And we do that with the purpose of creating an environment where our people feel that they are contributing to something bigger. We really believe that you know, the, the workspace and the, the work environment and the workers' world is obsolete. And we believe that every person that comes to a place like UiPath will have to be here and feel that they have a meaningful contribution. And that meaningful contribution is differently perceived by the person herself or himself. And it depends on what they bring from home with. Right? A parent will have a different need versus somebody who has no family obligations whatsoever. So that what we do with that work is to understand the personas, mm -hmm. understand who they are, understand what teams they are coming from, understand what are their objectives that they go after, and really personalizing their learning experience, their interaction with our people, their collaborations with other members of the different teams. And it's very valuable because it's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. It's really different. And only because we managed to automate some of the tasks, we now have the time to understand their needs and then design experiences for them where they bring their whole self to work and they have a meaning contribution. Generation Z is the latest group to join the workforce. What can you share with us about their working habits, career aspirations, and your engagement strategy for this group of employees? We love this generation because of um, different things. First of all, they are native digital. Their savviness around using technology is like by default. Um, they were raised with you know, interacting with voice over through their phone and, you know, the Alexa, the Siri, they're using that technology already. So when they come in, they expect a certain level of technology that will give them mm -hmm. productivity gains or it will give them an easiness of getting their work done. And, and we love their native focus on digital aspects. That's one. The other thing is that they really challenge us in terms of the work they are willing to commit to. The most favorite question that they have is why. And unless you have a strong answer to why you are asking them to do this or the other, their level of commitment will be higher or lower. So they are challenging us from ensuring we have a digital enabled workspace for them and the right answer to the question, why you want me to focus on this? And it's raising the bar in the way of us interacting with them. We do have an internship program that we launched this year globally. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the first population to this generation which will educate and inform our design for next programs in the company. Um, we have more answers than, than we have more questions than answers here and, and we are looking forward for the experience to finish to allow the program to come to an end and we'll take a step back, speak with them, have their feedback and based on their insights we will know better on how to maybe redesign, adapt, adjust some of the programs that we run globally for our people. It's a generation that comes with a lot of thought-provoking questions and we we are open to have a dialogue about it and get better with their input. What do you believe to be the HR trends in the next decade? Oh, in the next decade, it sounds so far away, although I remember I was in 2015 and uh, I was facilitating different management workshops, leadership programs, and, and we had this exercise of start with the end in mind and we were thinking of 2020 what the world will be like and how I as a management team will get prepared five years from now to reach 2020. Um, and 2020 was just yesterday. So if I think about how quickly the time will go by, 2031 is not that far away. I think it's plenty of opportunity. Like I, I, look, of, uh, I look at the, the last year and although there are some unfortunate situations, audiences, you know, troubles in the way we cope with the pandemic, I really believe there is an opportunity in that hardship period we've went through. 
there was a lot of acceleration moments of using technology, finding a lot of resources within ourselves that we didn't knew we had. It was a lot of challenging our own paradigms in thinking maybe we didn't thought we could do that, but we had to and we were forced to, and now we realize that actually is better this way than it used to be. So I believe that the HR practice overall is really, really challenged in an accelerated manner by rethinking their contribution. I believe that work from home, if that was a perk or a benefit two years ago, slowly but surely this will become the norm. And companies out there that will not know how to integrate work from home as part of their ways of working will lose big time. Also productivity tools. Like, you know, you expect to come and contribute with having some productivity tools that will have your life easier. We have another bot that um, at whatever time you set it up, it shows you the agenda for the day. And right there and then in that instant, it helps you make decisions whether or not you want to be part of that meeting, you want to reschedule that, or you want to cancel it for good. We have Clara, who is a, an assistant that helps us with scheduling. So, you know, you send an email to Clara, you tell her that you want to meet with Elena tomorrow and she will find time in your schedule to make that happen. This has to be there. It has to be part of the practices out there to help our people, you know, save time and focus on more added value um, contributions. I also believe that the world will change in terms of having just one job. You go to, you get some money and you are done with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that 10 years from now, we will have very few people who will only have one job. And I think that the companies that will focus on creating that job profile with, which gives people the opportunity for them to find their meaning in life, not just the job, will win. Because otherwise, people will work less for money and more for building a le legacy, leaving something behind them, you know, and, and contributing to a bigger purpose, bigger than themselves. And, and we have to challenge ourselves and think through how in the company I'm part of, I can create an environment for people to actually find their meaning in that work. Because otherwise, they will leave for somebody who does that. So, you know, it's going to be an opportunity and a challenge at the same time. And we have to reinvent ourselves. We definitely have to. We have to be closer to the needs. We have to speak the language of the business we support. We absolutely have to be innovative, innovative in the world of offering diversity. Um, we have to find a way to show people how their future will look like in this company, like career advancement. That's something that keeps people with us. If, if we are able to show them what they can do a year from now and two years from now, and they see their own path and how they can learn, then yes, it will be a good place to work. But if we cannot, then they will look for a company that can offer that. So it's, it's fun, it's challenging, it's thought provoking and, um, the standard has just raised a couple of bars up. It's, um, it's challenging, but it's fun. What has been the challenge that has pushed your limits and helped you grow since joining the team in 2019? Oh, I love this question. Um, I've joined the company in 2019 as the global talent head for um, UiPath. However, before that, the way I interacted first with this magical people of UiPath was through the leadership program that was developed back then. So that was 2018. It was a moment in which Daniel made a fantastic strategic decision to move the headquarter from Romania to US. And that was very visionary because otherwise I don't think we will. We would have gotten to IPO, which happened earlier this year. And in 2018, we had this leadership program of which I was asked to coach, facilitate, and help our team leaders become a better version of themselves, learning how to work with others and putting their 
you know, building basics of being a manager there. And I remember that that moment was when people in Romania would feel that they cannot contribute anymore to decision making because the shift of power from Romania to U.S. happened over almost overnight. And it was part of the process, um, but it was painful. So it was a fine line between allowing the space in which people would put their frustration out there and then being able to work with that, showing uh, a brighter future, helping them find resources to actually transform and change and adapt to the new situation. And we had a blast, like out of those interactions and workshops and coaching sessions, we managed to solidify what leadership looks like in terms of expectations. And that was the first moment when I said, something magic is happening here. And this is really a once in a lifetime opportunity. And being a Romanian, although I traveled around the world, I've been seven years away from home in, in US, in Poland, my second baby girl was born in Poland and in UK, I've always felt a little bit of pride of contributing to something that was born in Romania. So when Daniel and Marius called up and say, we want you to be part of the company, um, I could not say no. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I've joined. And the first challenges that I had was wrapping my head around that this is not a corporation. And just so that you imagine, these people have this bullshit button that they touch and you actually feel it in the room. There is no corporate bullshit happening. Like it's so real and so authentic and so focused on getting the work done, make you, making sure you contribute successfully to you know, the team's objective or whatever you go after. And it's, uh, it requires a shift. It really requires a shift. And then the values. The values are such a, it, you know, if you put bold and humble together, there's a tension in there and there is a paradox. Like, mm -hmm. how can you stay humble mm -hmm. when you got to the Gartner chart being the number one RPA company out there? And how can you like be bold now that you are a public company and you absolutely have to put the business case together, share with Wall Street ahead of time what you want to go after and actually deliver what you said you will. So there is a tension in there around also being humble and speaking less about your results, but allowing the project to speak about the, the value added and being bold, going after ambitious milestone, making sure you, you know, challenge the status quo and you are always true to your mission of accelerating human achievement. And then immersion and fast, like when you get immersed into the work that you do, you wanna stay there, right? Understand the objectives, feel the vibe, get to know people, you know, start with the end in mind, but leave the judgment, suspend the judgment and, and be there. In the same time, you have this fast here, which says we need to get out there and be agile and, and, and deliver. So the four values that we currently have are intention. And, and I love that about it. And um, we know that what got us here won't get us there. And we are this year in a moment in which we have to just take a step back, understand what are those core behaviors, practices, leadership expectations that got us here. We need to have a strategic decisions of what we keep from what we had, but also reflect on what is that we need in terms of behaviors to get us to where we want to go. And there is this work that we will need to do with our leadership team so that we have the North Star and we know what we go after. But it's exciting, you know, it's part of the journey. The culture is ever evolving and we are adding on different things. We are challenging the status quo. We are challenging what got us here and how can we get better. And it's fun. It's, there is no one day that looks the same and it's challenging. Like, yes, you plan how the quarter looks like, you plan how the month looks like, you plan how the week looks like, but then when you are there in the moment, you know that the plan will change and we have to adapt and we have to adjust. And it's, it's fun. It's, a challenging experience mm -hmm. altogether.
Now my final question, what advice would you give a young startup team when it comes to nurturing their business culture from the beginning? I can only give you my insights by talking with the founders and spending some time with them because I wasn't part of it from the very beginning. But what I've learned from them is a couple of things. First of all, you have to have the behaviors and the values right from the get-go. Because having those and knowing what you want to nurture, it will act as a compass when you make decisions. If you know from the get-go what you go after, what you are not willing to tolerate, then that particular guidance will actually help you make the right decisions, right strategic decisions. Not having a compass, you can go different places, but having that compass, that, that you know, core set of, this is who we are, this is what we believe in, and this is what we will hold each other accountable for, will guide the direction and the trajectory of that startup to go after whatever objective they have. So that is one. Secondly, like if you talk with our founders, including Daniel, who is our CEO, but also the other founders that chose to have a little bit of a not visible role, and that is Lavinia and Adi Dorak and um, Marius Turka and Andra, they, they've always stayed true to who they are. And doing that, having such a tremendous success in such a short period of time is such a quality that it's almost, um, I don't know, too good to be truth. Like, I spent a couple of weeks with them um, in April and I was like mesmerized by the fact that they are absolutely the same people, sharing the same values, preoccupied by answering the same questions and being challenged by solving a problem and um, never, never forgetting where they came from. And it's such a unique attribute, you know, to stay true to who you are, even if the success came year after year and they had to pinch themselves because it was like, this is happening. Yes, it's happening, you know. And that's what I would say as a startup, have your compass. Know what you believe in, know who you are, know what will guide your decision from the get-go. And then as the time goes by and you achieve different milestones, be true to yourself. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was amazing. Thank you for the, the interview and the insights. Thank you for watching. At The Recursive, we aim to provide constructive reporting on the progress of the local innovation community in Southeast Europe. My name is Elena, and until next time, I invite you to read stories that shape stories on our website.